Why do you think anyone is going to read and cite your paper? I'm not being mean, I'm not trying to be negative, but really, why do you think out of all of the bazillions of papers that are out there, why is someone going to read your paper? The odds are good that if they're reading it, it's because you had a catchy title or your abstract had some kind of hook on it that then led them into reading your introduction and the rest of the paper, and that because you wrote a solid piece of research that made key contributions to the field, that you're now going to have big impact. But that all started <laughs> with a compelling title and a solid abstract. That's exactly what we're going to talk about in today's episode of Code Club. Hey folks, I'm Pat Schloss, and over the past 20-25 years, I've published more than 100 peer-reviewed manuscripts. All of those manuscripts have had a title and an abstract, as well as, hopefully, solid science behind them. Well, while I'd like to think the titles are compelling and the abstracts are well-written, the reality is that I'm not so convinced that my abstracts or titles are anything special. So, as I was putting this video together, I decided, you know, I'm going to be really intentional about how I think about putting together my title and my abstract so that I can give you good advice on how to do the same. It's good to think of your title as a breadcrumb leading to the abstract. And we've all lived now in the internet age for decades, <laughs> um, and we, we've heard of clickbait, right? And so clickbait, of course, is the idea that you've got a title that then induces you to click on a link, and then you get to that link and you realize that really has nothing to do with the title. So we don't want to do that. But we do want to have a compelling title that a reader sees as they're searching through Google Scholar or PubMed or some other uh, search engine for pub, uh, scientific publications. And they say, wow, that's an interesting title. I want to learn more about that. That's the first step, right? A compelling title gets you into the paper, so to speak. It brings you to perhaps an abstract. And as you read through the abstract, you say, wow, this is really compelling. They've got some interesting results. I want to learn more about their motivations, their questions, and how they did what they did, right? So that is, those are the last sections of the paper that I work on when I'm working on my manuscript. If you've been tracking previous episodes of Code Club, you know that, that the abstract and the title um, are two elements of the manuscript I've been working on that I haven't, I haven't fleshed out yet. Yeah, I have a title in there. It's fairly tongue-in-cheek, a play off of another very provocative title that's in the literature. I'm not going to use that um, because it's kind of like borderline plagiarism, and I don't really like the original title at all, and so I don't really want to riff off of that title. We'll come up with our own title, and I'll show you how. So instead of starting with the title, I'm going to start with the abstract today. And before I start writing, I want to know what the journal expects my abstract to say, how long it expects to be, um, whether it expects there to be any type of structure. So my plan is to submit this paper to M-Sphere. As you read through this instruction to authors, I know this document is really long and uh, dry and tedious. And it's like, who reads these things? Well, I'm telling you, read it, because it's got a lot of great information in here to understand what they're looking for. So as I'm scanning down through here, I'm looking for the abstract. And so what I see is that M-Sphere and all of the ASM journals have a two-part abstract. And so they have abstracts consisting of two sections with their own headings, an abstract and the importance. And so they're going to be published together. If you do a PubMed search and find papers published by M-Sphere or any of these ASM journals, you'll find both sections are, are are, are present. Um, they give you a sample structured abstract for guidance. So the abstract section should be 250 words or less and should concisely summarize the basic content of the paper um, without presenting extensive experimental details. The important section is a 150 word non-technical description of the significance of the work. I have had a horrible time trying to figure out how to write an important section in the papers that I previously published in ASM's journals. I think the key thing to focus on is that the importance is a non-technical description of what's going on. Of course, 250 words for the abstract, 150 words for the important section. One of the nice things is that M-Sphere here gives me a link to an example structured abstract. And so it brings us to this paper, Single Nucleotide Polymorphisms in Regulatory Encoding Genes, have an additive effect on virulence gene expression in a Vibrio cholera clinical isolate, right? Really nice uh, descript, uh, direct, and tells you exactly what uh, they found in this paper, right? So they have the abstract, 
which is, I can see has a lot of kind of technical jargon, a lot of gene names, a variety of abbreviations. I would try to kind of minimize the number of abbreviations in there. But then as you look at the importance section, we see this is written in a language that most college educated people I think could read and understand. It doesn't expect you to be a expert in the field to understand what's going on. There isn't a lot of jargon in here. There's no abbreviations uh, and it is obviously not technical. So I think this gives us a good framework for thinking about how we write the structured abstract where we have the abstract that's more technical and the important section that's non-technical but really highlights the significance of the work. One of the things I like to see is that uh, the final sentence of the importance section here starts with the significance of our research is dot, 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 and they can then complete that sentence. And so I'm going to make a mental note to myself that I want my importance section to have a sentence that makes it crystal clear that what the significance is of my work. Excellent. So another tool that I'm a big fan of, uh, as I already mentioned, is that Nature Publishing has a, um, they call they don't call them an abstract, they call it a summary paragraph. It's the first paragraph of their papers. And they have a template for what they're looking for when they receive a paper and they're looking at that first paragraph. And so uh, if you recall back a, variety, a number of episodes, I talked about the and but therefore framework for writing, that you have a series of observations that are connected by and, 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 but, right, there's a but statement then that increases the conflict or identifies a hole in um, our current understanding. And then a therefore statement that resolves the conflict and says, therefore, we went off and did this, or therefore, we then did this experiment and found blah, right? And so this is really laid out as a series of two and but therefore uh, threads. So one or two sentences providing a basic introduction to the field and, right? Two to three sentences giving more detailed background, comprehensible to scientists in a related discipline. Uh, that's another and. The other thing they're doing here is it's a funnel, right? So two sentences giving basic introduction, right? That's, sen that's sensible to any scientist. And then more detailed background to people in a related discipline. So they're really bringing in that funnel. Then the but sentence. But one sentence clearly stating the general problem being addressed in a particular study. Therefore, right, here we show, or something like that, summarizing the main result. So there we have our and but therefore, where again, we're funneling the reader to the result. Then they give you two or three more sentences explaining what the main result reveals in direct comparison to what was thought previously. Another way you might do this would be kind of, you know, detail the results a little bit more. And then one or two sentences putting the results into a more general context. And so there might be not be another but here, but this is kind of a therefore um, that, again, puts things into the general context. Finally, they have two or three sentences to provide a broader perspective, readily comprehensible to any scientist in any discipline. This is a lot like our importance section for ASM journal papers. The other thing that we're starting to see more of, I think more in like cell publications uh, from Cell Press, is um, a visual abstracts. So a, a picture to give um, some kind of like a non-technical overview of what happened in the paper. So I'm going to use this outline, this template, to create my abstract for our paper. To do that, I'm going to go ahead and go uh, to my project root directory, and I'm going to open up uh, my manuscript. Uh, I'm going to do this in my text editor rather than our studio. It, it doesn't really matter where you do it. Um, so I'm going to come down to my abstract section. You'll see that I have it uh, just kind of empty here with the number of words. And I'm going to paste in uh, some bullets. I've got these double pound signs for the instructions from the nature outline. Um, I'm going to then move this down uh, to my importance section. The next step after I've got this template inserted is to flesh it out with some bullet points. Um, what I might do is grab sentences that I've already written in the manuscript and drop them in here. I can then flesh those out, maybe modify them, pull them together, and edit. And so I'm going to do that over a series of steps. 
Uh, one mental image or model that I have is that I don't know if Microsoft Word still has this feature, but they used to have a feature called executive summary or make an executive summary where they would take your like term paper <laughs> or your document and they basically pulled out the topic sentences of every paragraph and then plopped it together as an abstract. That's kind of what I'm thinking about here, but again, trying to fit it into these different categories. And of course, I'm not gonna do that with the topic sentences, but that's just kind of a mental model I have for what this template is going after. So again, one or two sentences providing basic introduction to the field. I might put something in there about uh, what are Amplicon sequence variants? What's the controversy with OTUs? Um, I guess that might be in here, right? The two or three sentences with more detailed background. Whereas this first sentence or two might kind of outline, you know, this area of, you know, the importance of 16S rRNA genes and what it's done to overall microbial ecology and microbiome research. Yeah, and then I could maybe go into saying, what are OTUs, what are ASVs? And then point out that there's this conflict over, you know, a movement and popularity of ASVs to supplant OTUs. And then I could say, the main result that we found is that if you use ASVs, you're gonna artificially split genomes into multiple different clusters. So I'm gonna work on that and I'll come back and show you what I've come up with. Okay, so I, in many cases, I've taken sentences from the main body of the manuscript and use them to address uh, the various questions or elements of the template that I wanna create. And so one or two sentences providing a basic introduction to the field, comprehensible to a scientist in any discipline, right? This 16S gene sequencing is a powerful technique. Uh, sentence is the very first sentence of my paper, right? Um, and so I'm kind of plagiarizing myself. And you'll see that as we kind of massage this, uh, bring things together with transitions and editing to get it down to 250 words, that it's not gonna seem so redundant between the abstract and the rest of the paper. But anyway, I've gone through and done that uh, where I've filled in key results, key statements into this template um, to a point where it's quite long um, and is, but has all the information, right? And so if I highlight all this, my word counter will tell me how many words I have. Of course, it's gonna have those, those templates. And at the bottom, it tells me I have 429 words and so, you know, maybe 100 of those words or 150 of those words are these bullets uh, that I'm then filling in. So we've got too many words, but it's better to have too much than too little because then we can still uh, cut and prune and, and edit, right? Um, I also, in my importance section that I'll show you here, um, is that, again, I have some bullet points that I think are uh, general and non-technical, right? Um, I've got 16S rRNA gene sequences, but that's a little bit of jargon. Um, but um, I don't know. I, I, I feel like I have to include that in ASVs and OTUs because that's really what the paper is about. I only have 150 words, so I can't break it down too much further than that. Um, and, and so we'll see. But again, this, uh, this is, again, quite long. How many words do we have here? Uh, we have 159 words. So it's close. Uh, but we'll want to pull that together. So the next step that I'll do is I'll go ahead and remove these bulleted titles and I'll pull it together and I'll start editing. All right, so I've removed those bulleted titles and I've concatenated uh, my various uh, elements of text together. In my abstract here, I have uh, 320 words, so I'm 70 over the 250. Uh, that is a hard threshold. I've experienced this before where I had 251 words and the submission system would not let me proceed. So it has to be 250 words for the main abstract and 150 for the importance. So this is 70 words over. The other thing you'll notice in here is that I've got some holding, um, some uh, holder text uh, to describe things about like say, um, how many genomes were in the database that I used and how many species were there, as well as this information about the thresholds. Um, I can fill that in with R Markdown, but again, for now, I'm just focusing on the things that you can do in any platform, whether it's Microsoft Word or any word processing software. Um, I'll come back later and add in the R code to populate those values. I've done the same thing with the important section, and here I'm at 159 words, so I'm a little bit long. So what I'm gonna do next is think about um, what can I cut, what can I consolidate to make the package a lot tidier? Um, I look at this, uh, sec this the abstract paragraph, and I notice that 
Uh, so this is kind of my but sentence, right? However, ASVs and the use of ner overly narrow thresholds to identify blah, 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 creates the risk of splitting. Um, but I've got all this text up here that is kind of introductory material. That's 85 words. So if I could reduce this down to like one sentence or two short sentences, I could save a lot of text. The other thing um, is that I've got this sentence here that is kind of my general statement of what I found. Um, but that's also using up a fair amount of text, about 26 words. So I could perhaps forego that sentence and instead kind of emphasize the results um, a little bit more uh, with the actual values. So there's a variety of things I can do to clean this up, to tidy it up, and to get it to be shorter and perhaps more impactful. So I'm going to keep editing, and I'll show you what I come up with next. So here's the abstract that I came up with. Um, it's at about it's at 249 words, so it's just under the threshold. Um, and I think I think this reads pretty well. I think it's compact and it has this funnel. It gets me to the important results about the problem of splitting an individual genome into multiple bins when we use ASVs or overly fine uh, OTU definitions. My important section is at 147 words, so it's under the 150 word limit. Um, I also have uh, the significant sentence, you know, the current research is significant because it quantifies the risk of artificially splitting bacterial genomes into separate clusters. Okay. Um, and so this is, um, I, I think this is going to work. Um, I'll still do more editing of my abstract and important section as I proceed. Um, I also need to go in and plug in uh, the values for these holder values. I'll do that later um, using our markdown. You've seen me do that in previous episodes, so I'm not going to belabor the point here. Um, we've got a good abstract, an important section, I think. So the next thing I want to take on is the title. I'll go ahead and remove that 250 words because I know I'm in good shape. So the title that I have in here is a holder. Um, it was a tongue-in-cheek play with the original with the title of kind of a paper that I'm responding to, and. My version of the title was ASVs should not replace OTUs in marker gene data analysis. The original title, I think, was ASVs should replace OTUs in marker gene data analysis. Um, I don't want to. I don't want to be accused of plagiarizing their title. I also don't really like the original title because I don't think the data in the paper really did a good job of backing it up. As I've kind of shown here, there's at least one element of their argument that I think I've shown is incorrect. Again, this problem of artificially splitting uh, genomes into separate bins. The other thing that we'll have to come up with is a running title. If I go back to the instruction to authors, um, let's see, where was that? Um, and if I do a search for title, see if there's any information about titles. Uh, so here we go. Um, so the title, running title, and so forth. Um, so we need a title, um, and it should present each manuscript should present the results of an independent cohesive study. So we don't want like a series of titles. So like Pat's paper one, Pat's paper two, Pat's paper three. Each paper should stand on its own. Um, let's see. Avoid the main title subtitle arrangement. Avoid complete sentences and unnecessary articles. Um, we want to include the title and the running title. So the running title should not ex exceed 54 characters and spaces. Um, this is an example of the running title here for the, I mean, the document is called the instructions to authors, but this, what, what I have highlighted here is where that running title goes. So if you look at the top of any page, you can kind of see a, an abbreviated version of that title. And so um, that has to be less than 54 characters. They also have a sample title page. Um, mine is pretty close to that. And I think we're in good shape. So we need a title and we need a running title. There's a variety of thoughts on how to write a title. One thought is that you should kind of explain or describe what was done. Uh, this kind of goes back to what we talked about previously about figure legends or figure captions. Do you want them to be descriptive or do you want to tell the reader what they should see in the figure? I think we should tell the reader what they should see in the data. Um, another thing that I try to avoid in my titles is a description of methods. Um, the result I find should be true independent of the method, right? So I don't want to say, you know, characterization of the human microbiome using aluminum iSeq data, right? I mean, that's kind of a crappy title anyway, um, but I wouldn't want to certainly include using aluminum iSeq sequencing, right? 
uh, because it should be, the what I find should be independent of the sequencing platform that I used. Now, if I'm developing a new method using the Illumina MySeq platform, that can be in the title, but otherwise, um, I don't want my title to include the method, right? So I wouldn't say ASV should not replace OTUs and marker gene analysis based on analysis using data from the RN database project or whatever it's called, right? Um, so I don't want to include the methods. I also want it to be direct and tell the reader what they're going to learn when they read this paper. I don't want it to be generic about like, you know, analysis of intragenomic variation of um, 16S genes in bacterial genomes. Because that, that tells, tells you kind of what we did, but it doesn't tell you, doesn't allow me to tell you what I found. And again, if I want you to click on my paper, I want you to know what I found so you're eager to read more. So what do I do to come up with a list of titles or to come up with a title? Well, the first thing I do is I come up with a list of possible titles. So I'm going to go ahead and brainstorm. One of the things that I like to do is to have a document where I keep track of a bunch of titles um, and that that occurred to me over time. And um, I'll, as I'm kind of like doing whatever in my life, I might email myself from my phone uh, a, a title idea. And I'll create a document with all those title ideas. And some of them might be variations on each other. And then I'll go through and try to kind of find patterns, maybe come up with new title ideas, and then I'll refine it further. So let me come up with a list of ideas for possible titles, and and we'll we'll go from there. So I came up with a list of maybe about 10 or 12 different titles. They're all kind of variations on a theme. Um, some of the things, themes that popped out to me that I wanted to be in that title were things like operational taxonomic unit, amplicon sequence variant, uh, artificially splitting, um, uh, intragenomic variation. Those were kind of phrases or themes that, uh, that reappeared repeatedly. And so if those terms don't show up in my title, then I wanna be sure that those are included as a keyword when I submit the paper. So again, this first title is an example of what I think of as like a boring or overly descriptive title, Analysis of the Intragenomic Variation Among Bacterial 16S RNA Gene Sequences. Again, it doesn't tell you what I found, it tells you what I did. Um, and I want you to know what I found. Um, this was the, the holder title that I used. Um, and now that I think about it, you know, this might be a good tweet. As M-Sphere and other ASM journals and other, other journals now are inviting you to provide a tweet uh, that you might use uh, in helping to advertise your manuscript. And so this is a little bit provocative um, and, and might be a good way of um, helping to sell the paper. Uh, someone on Twitter might see that and be like, oh, wow, that sounds like that's on fire. I'm going to go check that out, right? So who knows? Um, and then you can see, as I kind of scroll through these lists, a variety of different titles. Um, you know, these all kind of, these two are similar to each other, you know, split bacterial genomes into different or into separate units of inference. Unit of inference is kind of wonky. Um, here, these start with adoption of amplicon sequence variants, blah, blah, blah. Um, and you can see I've got artificially splitting in here, right? Um, and kind of going through here, uh, one of the things that I noticed with these titles is that for the most part, they were negative, right? They were kind of saying, they're kind of bashing amplicon sequence variants. And so I wanted to write a couple titles that were positive, right? So use OTUs because they are good, right? Not don't use ASVs because they're bad, right? So I came up with a couple down here, um, these last four that I saw as being more positive. Um, I don't know, negative cells, unfortunately. So, but I wanted to have these in the mix as, as, part of my overall list of potential titles. So the next step, once I've got these dozen or so titles, is that I wanna refine them further and maybe get down to a, a handful of titles that I could then shop around to other people. So let me take this list, spend some time with it, and then I'll show you the final list that I came up with. Okay, so I came up with seven titles. Uh, two of them were the ones I said I didn't like. So the first one uh, was that overly descriptive, boring one that says what we did, not what we found. The second one is that placeholder one that would probably be a better tweet. Um, and then three through seven are kind of what I thought were the best of the different categories of titles that I had. So what I'm gonna do um, is to take these titles and I'm gonna put them into my lab Slack um, forum and ask the people in my lab what they think is the best title. Um, this is something that I would encourage you to do. 
pick a couple titles, share them with your friends or colleagues and see what they think uh, is the best title. So I'm gonna go put this in Slack and I'll give, give people in my lab a few hours to mull it over and we'll see what they thought was the best title. I let my survey run with my lab for a few hours. Uh, one of the things you can do in Slack is I put in my numbered list and then I put in uh, seven reactions. So the number, the emojis for each of the numbers and then invited everyone in my lab to, to choose two of the titles they liked the most. Um, and so, you know, there's six and seven didn't actually get any votes. So those were the more positive versions of the title, um, which is interesting, right? Um, that the, the negative sold better. Uh, people kind of liked the provocative one. Um, number two, um, a couple, somebody liked uh, the more descriptive version, but eh. But what sold, what really um, resonated the most with people in my lab was title three, Amplicon sequence variants, artificial, artificially split bacterial genomes into separate units of inference. Again, that separate units of inference, it's a little wonky, but um, I, I think that works pretty well. Uh, I could say into separate clusters, um, but you know, I think units of inference is good. We might come back and change that with clusters. And I might ask people again, you know, what do you prefer, units of inference or clusters? But for now, I'm pretty happy with that. So that's gonna become my new title. So I will come back to my manuscript and I will uh, put that in here and we're in good shape. Now my running title has to be 54 characters or less. And what I'll do, I think, is this is um, 96 characters. So let me put this down here for my running title. And maybe if I do ASVs, artificially split bacterial genomes into separate units of inference, um, that's 74 characters. And what if I did clusters? Um, what do I get there? That gives me 64 characters. Um, maybe I'll do our ASV is artificially split bacterial genomes. And that's good. Um, <clears throat> and so this comes in at 41 characters. And I think that that'll be a good running title. Um, you know, I'm not going to get my paper accepted or rejected because I have an amazing running title. Um, I think I think it's it's purely functional for when people print out the p paper as a PDF. So that's great. Okay, so I have my title, my running title, my abstract, my important section, and I'm really happy with how those look. Now, the final thing that I want to do is I want to create a document of keywords. Now, whenever I'm submitting my paper, I always forget to come up with a list of keywords before I'm submitting the paper. When I'm submitting the paper, then I'm in such a rush that I'm just annoyed that I have to come up with keywords. But again, if we're thinking about search engine optimization, we want to think about you know coming up with a good list of keywords. In general, we don't want our keywords to be in the title, and probably they don't necessarily need to be in the abstract. I don't really know how Google Scholar or PubMed's engines and algorithms work, but the title, it probably doesn't need to be in the title. So let's make a list of keywords. So ASV um, as an abbreviation for Amplicon Sequence Variants, OTU. Um, I've got 16S, um, I don't have 16S. So let's put in 16S R, RNA gene um, and let's do 16S RDNA. I hate that phrase, but people search for it. So let's include it. Let's do microbial ecology, um, microbiome, um, and microbial communities, and let's do bioinformatics. Um, and, and this might be a list that I, and this might be a list that I curate over time, kind of like the title ideas where I ruminate on it and I think of other keywords that come to mind. I think 10 is probably as many keywords as I want to include. Um, and I might, um, something I might do actually is to go ahead and Google some of these keywords and see what comes up. So why don't I do that? Let's go and Google um, ASV OTU and see what types of papers show up. Um, and so we see OTU versus ASV shows up for Zymo Research. Uh, this exact sequence variance paper that I'm kind of reacting to. Um, Amplicon sequence variants, ASVs versus OTUs, OTUs versus ASVs. Um, so there's a, a variety of the this kind of OTUs versus ASVs. So I think what I'll do is I will actually use that as one of my keywords. 
because when people search for ASV OTU, I want my paper to be at the top. So let's try OTU versus ASV um, and maybe ASV versus OTU. I don't know that that really matters, kind of flipping the order, but eh, we'll see. So I think that's a good list of keywords. As I'm continuing to edit and think about the paper, I might revise this list of keywords. Okay, so save that as keywords MD, and this is now located in my submission directory. So I'm in good shape. All right, so we've done a lot today, and this is really important stuff. Again, this is creating the funnel um, of how we get people that we want to be interested in our paper to get to our paper. We give them a compelling title that's direct, that tells them what's really important. That leads them then to the abstract, which is gonna be a funnel from broad interest to more narrow, identify the problem, show them the results, show them a little bit about how we found that result, and then give them the upshot, the therefore statement of why this was important. And then hopefully, um, you know, if they don't stop and read the important section for a more general statement of significance, they then go on and read the rest of the manuscript. So hopefully we've done everything we can to bring eyeballs to this paper. Um, and time will tell uh, whether people read it, uh, whether people search for it, and whether it comes up in search. Uh, but, you know, we can do our best. So what's more important than titles or abstracts or keywords or running titles or any of these things is that the research is really sound. I really want to emphasize that. I, though, definitely want eyeballs on my papers. And as much as we tell people, don't judge a paper by its title, don't judge a book by its cover, we all do, right? A good title, a provocative title is going to bring eyeballs. So I'm confident that the science here is solid. So I want to do my best to bring eyeballs to my paper so that people read it, so people cite it, and so people are influenced by that paper. I want to have influence, and getting people to read this, I think, is going to help bring that influence and get people to think deeper about how they're using these different methods of ASVs versus OTUs. Anyway, I hope you find this useful. I hope these are some tips that you can use regardless of what you're studying, uh, regardless of the type of work you're doing. I think it probably transcends even broader than scientific publishing. You know, writing a blog post, how do you pick a good title? How do you pick a good um, paragraph, a good hook to get someone into the paper? In the next episode, we'll continue on on our march towards getting this paper submitted. We'll go over my tips for how we edit a manuscript to get it polished really tight uh, and to be a good package that we're proud of and ready to submit. Anyway, keep working on your own writing. Let me know down below in the comments what are some of your tricks that you use to pick good titles and abstracts. I'd love to hear what you come up with. Please feel free to share your own expertise um, and, and we can all learn from each other. Anyway, until next time, keep practicing with these concepts, and we'll see you for another episode of Code Club.